last week's sermon series on the disciple Simon Peter. Now, if you stop and think about it, in nearly every recorded episode of Jesus' life, he is nearby. In fact, his name is mentioned 120 times in the Bible. In the beginning, where he's called Simon, a little later in the story, Jesus changes his name to Peter. And so you will see we call him Simon, Simon Peter, and Peter. That's all the same person. Well, Simon Peter is often known as the flawed but faithful disciple. He is bold in his faith one minute, proclaiming the word of God, seeking to follow Jesus at all costs, and then he's confused and frightened and scared and faltering the next. And each time that we find him bumbling and fumbling and mumbling, we learn some new dimension to Jesus' character. Several of our small groups are going to be doing a study of this uh, along with the sermon series. And there's one group that meets Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. They met this morning. And there are other small groups that are listed in your bulletin if you would like to join them. But in this series, we're going to explore six of the major stories about Simon Peter. And in the small groups, we're going to go into more of the background about what was going on at the time of the story. But we hope that you'll join us and learn more about this man who, if we think about it, is so very much like you and me. Well, today when we meet up with him, he's just finished a long night of fishing. Now, we know that nobody is on top of the world every day. Everyone has ups and downs. Sometimes the world is sweet and sometimes it's sour. Sometimes life moves briskly and we accomplish what we meant to do and we meet our personal goals. And sometimes we get stuck and we look failure in the face every day and we don't know how to get out of what we got in or what we don't know how we got into in the first place. And life seems to come to a halt. Today's gospel is about some discouraged men, three discouraged men, four if you include Andrew who appears in another account, another gospel account of this story. They were fishermen. Now, not recreational fishermen, not like Trisha was telling us, but they did this for a living. And their families went hungry when they didn't catch fish. Jesus had met them before when they were associated with John the Baptist, and he had even been to Simon Peter's house and cured his mother-in-law of a fever. But it was a very bad day for these four fishermen. They had fished all night, and caught nothing. Now it was morning, the morning after a night of failure. And they were washing their nets so they'd be ready for the next night's work. There was a crowd on the beach nearby, a big crowd, listening to Jesus really pressing in on him. And so Jesus is out on the water away from the crowd, and suddenly he steps into Simon Peter's boat, and he says, puts out a little from the shore. And so Simon Peter does that. From the boat, Jesus continues to teach the crowds, And when he's done, the crowd goes home, and Jesus then turns to Simon Peter and says, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now, it was really quite presumptuous for a landman, a carpenter, to tell a professional fisherman how to do his job. Very presumptuous. And Simon Peter answers Jesus immediately by explaining the facts of life to him. It won't do any good, he said. We've worked all night and caught nothing. There is no point to it. Ever been there? You do your best, you work hard, and the results are zero. An important relationship goes sour and there's nothing you can do about it. Or you watch a marriage dissolve and you you can't save it. Or a project you've worked hard upon just won't pan out and it it seems like the harder you try, the less you produce. Have you ever been in that place where your wisdom tells you just to give up? I have. And the last thing you want to hear is, try harder. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they were not stupid men. They knew the lake. They knew the ledges where the fish congregated and the kind of weather you had to have to bring in a good catch. Their families had been working this lake for generations. They knew the time to fish, where to fish, and they had gone fishing at the right time and in the right place, and they'd come up empty. Try over there, Jesus says, over there in the deep water. Let down your nets for a catch. 
Master, we have worked all night. We are tired. We have done this, what, everything we should have done. We did what our fathers taught us and their fathers, but we've caught nothing. But I guess if you say so, we'll do it again. Why Simon agrees to go out into the deeper water, we don't know. Maybe he was learning to trust Jesus. Maybe he did to humor him. Maybe it was something in the tone of Jesus' voice. Whatever the reason, Simon Peter agrees to go out further. Well, you know the story from there. They threw the nets out from Simon's boat and they caught such a great catch of fish that their nets began to break. And then when the other disciples pulled alongside and tried to help them load it into the boats, the boats began to sink. It was an amazing catch, a catch made in deep water, a catch made where there should have been no catch whatsoever, a catch at a time of day when there should have been no catch. Now, right before they got this catch, Simon says something very significant, something you and I might say. Master, we've worked hard all night, and we haven't caught anything. What Simon said, in effect, to Jesus was, I know my business. I've tried it before. We worked all night. Nothing happened. So what's the point? Undoubtedly, my friends, we are so like Simon Peter. We do our, know our business. Maybe we know it too well. We know our child is not educated or old enough to do a particular job or to join a particular responsibility. Or that our brother is too busy for us to ask a favor. Or that our neighbor doesn't care to help. Or that we ourselves aren't talented enough to do what people are asking us to do. We know these things about ourselves and others. And we feel frustrated. We feel alone. We feel inadequate. We believe that what is being asked of us, either as an individual or a part of a group, will not pan out. And we don't want to try again. We don't want to risk one more disappointment or one more failure. I know lots of folks who live frustrating lives because they refuse to risk such failure and disappointment. They have resources but don't use them, skills but don't develop them, dreams but don't follow them, gifts but don't share them. They know what is what, they know their business, and they're not about to be instructed in it by anybody else. They know who they are and who others are and what the situation is, and they're locked in by that knowledge afraid to risk, afraid to reach out, afraid to go into unfamiliar territory. Because in the end, they know what's going to happen. There's no point. There's no point in going beyond the place where the fish are normally caught. Put out into the deep waters and let down your nets. Fine, but we tried our best all night and it didn't work. But because you say so, we'll do as you ask. Recently, I talked to an old friend from seminary. We communicate over Facebook, and I was asking her how things were going in this church that she had um, gone to just two years ago. It was a small dying congregation in rural Indiana. At their first session meeting, a woman suggested that they start a social club, one that could meet on for one Friday night a month and do things like bowling or rotation dinners or card parties, theater, and so forth. And guess what the session said? We tried it before and it didn't work, so let's don't do it again. And they were right. They had tried it before, and they'd done their best several times, and it hadn't worked. Nobody was interested, and nobody came. But the session said, but if you want to do it, you just go ahead, but just know, don't be disappointed, and we're not going to come, so do your thing. <laughs> well, the church had in that day about 65 people, 40 of whom were retirement age and older. Now, my girlfriend didn't think that this was a particularly good idea. She said she felt like, you know, they're supposed to be fulfilling the Great Commission. Going bowling? How's that going to fulfill the Great Commission? She went to seminary and all learned all these things about proclaiming the gospel, and her group wants to go bowling. But she was new, and she didn't want to, you know, get people upset, was trying to be, get everybody to like her, so she said, sure. Well, the first meeting of the social club had 10 people there. The second had 16 and the her third had over 20, and all of the people were age 40 and under. Now, two years later, this once-dying church in Indiana is thriving. They have a social club which is thriving, and worship attendance has increased. 
my friend wrote to me, who would have thought a social club? She went on to write, but you know, I guess there's truth in that proverb, the family that plays together stays together. Put out in the deep waters and let down your nets for a catch. Sometimes we need to be stimulated by someone who lives outside our frame of reference. Sometimes we need to listen to another point of view. Sometimes we need to risk failure one more time to go and do what our common sense tells us not to do and try what we know won't work. Sometimes we just need to head out in deep water and let down our nets for no better reason than it's because Jesus has asked us to. Oswald Chambers once said that we have to learn to make room for God, to give God elbow room. I really like that. We need to give God elbow room. Now, you've heard me say many times that I love Simon Peter. I think I love him because he's so much like us. Or maybe he's so much like me. He's reluctant to break out of the ordinary. And he gets discouraged when he doesn't see results. I think this reading might suggest that we should be willing to set the familiar side aside and try new things. You see, Jesus didn't simply come to make each one of us into some kind of metaphorical fisherman going out to catch souls with a line of faith so we can be displayed in some heavenly trophy case. He came so that we would have abundant life, a full and rich life, a life in which we know and experience and share the love of God, a love which conquers the sting of death and ensures that in the end, Our labors are not in vain, no matter how many days our nets may come up empty. To to achieve that life, we have to do something. We have to recognize that our knowledge and our experience is not equal to God's knowledge and God's experience. We have to recognize that God's ways are superior to our ways, that God's wisdom is greater, God's timing is better, God's counsel is more life-giving than our own. Our nets may come up empty for days in a row, but if we're open to God, if we're willing to listen and try new things, if we're willing to venture into the deep waters, or simply if we're willing just because God asks us to do some things that maybe we've tried before and given up on, our nets in the end will be filled so abundantly they may break. Just last week we had an activity fair here. And there were opportunities for you to see what the different ministry teams do and and sign up for things. And today, you received a sheet of paper with ways in which you can give of yourself. Now, you may be reading that and think, been there, done that, never going to do it again. I've done my share. It's time for somebody else to do it. Some of you are looking down when I said that. (laughs) Maybe God is calling you to put out your nets into deeper waters. I challenge you to listen to God. What is God calling you to do? Where is God calling you to let down your nets? This past week, I was at my hairdresser's, and she was telling me about her small group, which all came about because she put out a net into some deep water she had tried before. About nine months ago, she got remarried, and she and her new husband moved to a subdivision in northwest Georgetown, pretty far out of the city a long ways from her church. Now, her husband was new to faith, and she really wanted them to be in a small group, but he has a very early morning job, and he said, there's no way we're going all the way back into town for a small group and come back home. So he said, why don't you start one here? And she said, no. I've tried that before. Nobody wanted to come to my house. I'm not going to do it. No. But he kept pushing. So they invited their neighbors, none of whom came to their church, And today they have 12 people that come every single week to Bible study. In fact, when they went on vacation right town, the group decided to skip because they didn't want one single person in the group to miss one single time together because they might miss something that happened. Every time I see her, she tells me some new blessing they've received through the Bible study. This summer they did Acts, which was kind of fun because we were doing Acts here and she was doing Acts, and so we would share things about it. They have been blessed tremendously because she listened to God She put out her nets into the deep, and a new group started that has blessed 12 people. Friends, where is God calling you to put out your nets? Have you tried before and failed? Listen to God. Let out your net, maybe in a new place, or in a place you've already tried, but this time God's calling you to do it again. 
Remember that God's grace makes all things new. It makes us who we are supposed to be. It makes us who God has called us to be. Let out your nets into the deep water. Let us pray. Gracious and most holy God, it is so easy for us to give up and get discouraged when things don't go the way we expect. And there are times when we feel a little nudge to try something new, but we don't want to do it because it's going to take too much time and too much energy and we're so afraid of failure. Lord, give us the courage to listen to your Holy Spirit and nudge us to let out our nets into the deep water. May we try something new or something we've done before that you are calling us to do. And may our nets fill to overflowing. God, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.